We started things off by selecting a captain, though I wasn't particularly keen on the idea. However, I was ultimately chosen to lead this ragtag crew of six men, one of whom, Dallas's cook named Richard Field, Dallas's cook, was unarmed. Our weaponry consisted of a motley assortment of guns and hatchets, with one regular axe and a large camp hatchet to round things out. With all of our possessions piled up on the bank, we examined the old ferry boat we had selected as our vessel. Despite its age, it was still in good shape, thanks to the sand that had filled it. We scrounged up a couple of oars and some poles to help us navigate, though our cordage was pretty sparse. The boat itself wasn't the most elegant craft I'd ever seen. It was about twelve feet long and six or seven feet wide, with a somewhat awkward shape. Still, it could carry a decent amount of weight, and it seemed like the most sensible way to make our way to the Pacific. In fact, we wondered why everyone else wasn't doing the same. Our crew consisted of W. L. Manley, Mississippi, McMahon, Charles, and Joseph Hazelrig, Richard Field, Alfred Walton, and John Rogers. Once we had loaded up the boat, we untied the ropes and set off down the river, feeling a sense of relief that we weren't headed toward Salt Lake City and the prospect of wintering there. At the mouth of Ham's Fork, we glimpsed a group of Indians encamped nearby, but we didn't care to get too close to their territory, so we stayed on the opposite side of the shore. The tribespeople, however, urged us on with fervent gestures beckoning for us to come ashore. But I pretended not to understand their gestures and gestures, and we kept on our course. The current of the river grew faster and more powerful as we descended, transforming into a roaring, tempestuous force carving its way through rocky obstacles that loomed ahead. Each of us clutched a long pole, and we arranged ourselves strategically on both sides of the raft, ready to push ourselves free from any dangers. The waters weren't too deep, but they made quite a tumult as they crashed and surged among the rocks, forcing us to speak loudly just to be heard. As the raft picked up speed, I dug my pole into the riverbed and gave it a sudden thrust to avoid a massive boulder. But instead of freeing us from danger— the pole became lodged between two rocks, and I was violently yanked out of the raft by its energy, landing in the middle of the river with a thud. I plunged into the torrent, drenched from head to toe, and paddled feverishly towards the shore, accompanied by the cheering and waving of my companions who were relieved to find out I hadn't been harmed. I just shrugged it off, remarking that it was all par for the course, given our watery expedition to California. The following day I took a break and wandered onto land where, to my delight, I spotted a pair of sleek antelopes grazing nearby. I shot one of them, which gave us a lot of meat to sustain us through our journey. As we calculated our progress, we figured that we covered about thirty miles per day, which was much faster than the pace of tired oxen. We came across one stretch of the shore that boasted a thick line of willows and, set back a bit, a high cliff face. In between lay a strip of lush green grass where we rested and recuperated for a while. We were passing by when suddenly a herd of elk bolted from the grassy meadow and galloped down the river resembling a stampede of horses. One of them scampered up a narrow ravine with steep walls, trapping itself within its confines. Determined to catch our dinner for the night, we posted a guard at the entrance while three of us negotiated the canyon to shoot the elk. After a couple of shots from my companions, I took aim and finished the job with my third shot. The unmistakable sight of the Rocky Mountain elk was a feast to behold, so we took the carcass onto our boat and continued floating down the river. Our journey had been serene and blissful so far, with each of us taking turns resting while the others navigated the boat. On the fifth day of our voyage, while I was snoozing, our boat changed direction around a bend in the stream and suddenly the gradually sloping mountains on both sides gave way to a steep and mighty range right in front of us. The boys thought we had reached the end of the river, and I couldn't argue with them. The thought of us having to traverse Brown's Hole on foot seemed like our only option, as I did not intend to follow the river down into any kind of cavern. As we moved closer to an immovable cliff, it seemed as if the river was leading us to a dead end. Just as we prepared ourselves for the worst, the river took a sharp right turn behind a tall peak that appeared to be standing on its tip. We discovered that this was a colossal fissure, at least two thousand feet deep and possibly more, with walls that appeared to lean in towards the water the higher they got. The crevice was far wider at the bottom than it was at the top, which was more than two thousand feet above our heads. 
we found ourselves wedged between towering rocky walls with a swift river running between them. Our boat often got caught on rocks, requiring us to get out and manually maneuver it over the obstacles. We were grateful for our sturdy tow line, which allowed one of us to walk along the river bank and ensure we didn't lose control of the boat. As we progressed, the mountains on either side of us seemed to loom even higher, and occasionally we caught glimpses of trees leaning perilously over the waterway. High above, we spotted wild mountain sheep perched on rocky outcroppings, staring down at us with a mix of curiosity and defiance. They were so far away that they appeared almost out of reach, but we knew better than to underestimate their agility. This was a land untamed, a place where nature reigned supreme. We saw few signs of human presence, save for an old cottonwood tree bearing marks from an axe. We were reminded that we were likely the first people to ever explore this region, and the thought filled us with both awe and trepidation. As we proceeded through the canyon, we grew increasingly hungry, our supplies dwindling with each passing day. Despite our hunger, we couldn't help but marvel at the sheer beauty of the landscape around us. The canyon was a deep, dark chasm, and we knew that no sunlight had ever penetrated its depths. The sky above was but a narrow sliver, barely visible from our vantage point. At one point we came upon a spot where the rock jutted out over the water, forming a smooth wall. It seemed like the perfect place to leave a lasting mark of our journey. I clambered up to a high point above the waterline, armed with a makeshift brush and a mixture of gunpowder and grease for paint. With a steady hand, I daubed the rock with the words, Captain W. L. Manley, USA. We didn't know if we were within American territory or not, but we wanted to make sure that our presence was duly noted. As we continued through the canyon, we couldn't help but wonder what lay ahead. The unknown was both exhilarating and frightening and we knew that we were at the mercy of the untamed wilderness. But we were determined to press on, to explore this breathtakingly beautiful but forbidding terrain. For us, it was the ultimate adventure, a chance to test our limits and explore the very edges of our world. Just as the sun was setting, we reached a spot where enormous boulders, larger than any cabin I'd ever seen, had tumbled down from the mountain and filled up the riverbed. Our boat could go no further— we unloaded everything, and my companions held the stern line while I stripped down and plunged into the raging torrent. With gritted teeth, I pushed the boat around the obstructions, my friends slowly paying out the line until it was just right. Let go, I shouted as I grasped the bowline. In one swift maneuver, I jumped overboard and reached the shore. Holding onto the boat, I carefully guided it past the rocks until we reached a spot with deeper water. This is where we made camp. As the guys set to work unloading the boat, I gazed up towards the mountaintop and noticed a smooth patch about fifty feet above where the large boulders had tumbled. In great, bold letters, the name Ashley, 1,824 inches, was painted. This was the first sign of any white man's presence in this wild terrain. It looked as though some audacious adventurer had made his mark here a quarter of a century before. I learned later that there were some people in St. Louis with that name, and they might have had some connection to this early explorer. But our journey was far from over. Further ahead, another mammoth rock blocked our path. We tried to cross the river, but it was impossible. So we unloaded once again and came up with a plan. All but one of us hopped onto the huge rock with our poles. The other guy, holding onto a rope, was supposed to lower the boat down as far as he could, then let go of the rope. We would stop the boat with our poles and push it out into the river to let the current carry it over the obstruction. But the force of the water was too strong. When the boat collided with the rock, we were powerless to stop it. In an instant it was wedged against the rock, pinned so tightly that it seemed it would be there forever. It was a sudden end to our voyage, leaving us with no choice but to contemplate the safety of our very existence. Would we be safer among the Mormons, or out here in this wild country alone? Our boat was lost beyond recovery, and desperation set in. Surveying the area, I spotted two pine trees, sturdy and about two feet in diameter. It was then that I made the decision. We must choose between trudging on foot or fashioning a couple of canoes out of these sturdy trees. We opted for the latter, and we worked tirelessly, never ceasing with the axes, night or day until finally— our canoes were complete. 
While taking a break from the rigorous work, I went on a hunting expedition and found the land to be a sanctuary teeming with elk, giving me hope that we could replenish our supplies for the voyage ahead. Our canoes were about fifteen feet in length and two feet wide, yet the burden of the load was too much for them to carry. We needed to find bigger trees, and fortunately we stumbled upon two white pines, even sturdier than the first, towering over us. We worked with unwavering commitment, never stifling our progress. Kept safe by the light of the fire during the nights, we fashioned a mammoth canoe of between twenty-five to thirty feet in length. It was sturdy enough to hold all the valuables, including provisions, ammunition, and cooking utensils with me at its helm as the captain, for I was the only one with the skill of navigating these waters. We established a series of signs to signal danger or show the location of game, and with me leading the way we continued our journey down the stream with a renewed sense of purpose and hope. The river rushed us out of the lofty mountains and into a narrow valley where the stream's pace slowed and we coasted with ease. While winding around a bend, I caught sight of a group of elk standing on a sandbar, peering at us with great interest. I motioned for my companions to head towards the shore, and a few of us stealthily made our way down the bank, concealed by thick shrubs, until we were within range. We aimed at our targets and fired, bagging a beautiful doe on the opposite side of the river, and a magnificent buck on ours. We followed the regal creature through a flat meadow with dense clusters of willows, closing the gap until he broke into a proud trot. As he passed an opening in the foliage, I expertly took him down with a bullet to the head. The animal was a behemoth, likely weighing between five and six hundred pounds, with horns stretching to an impressive six feet. We spent the night cutting the meat into strips and drying it to preserve it, relishing in the realization that we had acquired food fit for a king. Continuing on our journey, the river began to lose momentum, crawling along sluggishly through a wide valley. We plucked sour red berries from bushes that draped over the water, wondering if they were akin to cranberries. One day I was able to snag an otter, and later on, whilst ashore, I hunted and killed a wild goose hovering over a small pond. As an added bonus, two mallard ducks also fell to my expert aim. Surprisingly, when I fired, the surviving ducks didn't fly away, but instead swam towards me as if intrigued by the spectacle. They had never seen a man before or heard the boom of a rifle. As I trudged along the shore, I caught sight of a small bear print, but I didn't have much time to look for the Bruin, so I left with my prey tucked under my arm, moving deeper into the stunning valley. There was a spot where a herd of horses had crossed and we could tell that white men were in charge of them because of the makeshift raft used to carry them across the river. Another day a swollen stream flowed in from the west filled with muddy water, and we noticed large fish about a foot long leaping to the surface. We tried to catch them, but they were too quick for us. One night, while camping on an island, I ventured off and managed to bag a deer. The sound of my rifle echoed through the valley, and the other guys rushed out to make sure I was all right. I was relieved to see them at my side. To make our rations last longer, we ate a lot of meat, which fueled our appetites and made the supply dwindle even faster. We spent a few days in the valley, beholding its beauty until we had to leave and head back into rough terrain, where the canyons were deeper and the water more tempestuous. I led the way with McMahon in the big canoe. The mountains transformed into rugged rocks, ascending higher as we floated along. After the first day of this, the river became inundated with boulders, forcing us to constantly unload and pull the canoes over them. At one point we discovered an abandoned campsite along with a skiff and some cumbersome kitchenware. A notice was pinned to the alder tree explaining that they had tried to navigate the river, but it was far too dangerous, so they abandoned their mission to travel overland to Salt Lake. I jotted down the names in my diary, which has burned long ago, so now their identities elude me. We felt a bit discouraged at the news, but decided to carry on and see for ourselves. The riverbed was more boulders than flowing water, and the intense slope made it harder to advance. Alder and willow trees sprouted from the riverbank, while up high on the mountain peaks we caught a glimpse of some timber. We didn't make much progress on some days, only traveling about four or five miles as we struggled to load and unload our canoes, hauling them over boulders with tiny streams trickling through. We spent most of our time barefoot, with the water roaring and splashing so loudly that we could barely hear each other speak. 
Despite the difficulties, we grew more daring and skillful, becoming capable of navigating some of the most treacherous rapids with ease. As we hiked through the wilderness, we spotted Rocky Mountain sheep up high on the peaks, looking down at us with defiance. Unfortunately, they were much too far away for us to take a shot at them, and we didn't have the time to try to sneak up any closer. With our dwindling food supply, we knew that it was essential to keep moving forward, despite the rugged terrain. Occasionally, we would be able to glide down the water, only to be met with rocks and rough waves once again. One afternoon, we came upon a sharp bend in the river, past a right angle, with a drop of two feet or more. I managed to navigate it successfully, and the others followed, cheering at our victory. However, as we began to head downstream, I caught sight of a looming danger and signaled that we should go ashore immediately and carry our canoes past the rapids. I led my own canoe towards the shore, successfully avoiding the danger, and waited for the rest of the group. However, they failed to heed my warning and attempted to navigate the rapid in the same way that I did. The river was dead straight for two hundred yards, void of any rocks. But the current was so strong that it created powerful ripples in the center of the channel that I have never seen before. The others lacked the experience to handle this type of stream, and the current drew them to the center, where the waves spun them upside down in every direction. The occupants of our sturdy canoe let go and swam frantically to shore. Fields, a man perpetually stricken with aquaphobia, had donned a life preserver every day since our departure from the wagons. He flailed his limbs wildly and gasped for air, his eyes filled with terror. After what seemed like an eternity, he reached the safety of solid ground. Another ill-fated canoe pushed its way down into the eddy below us and lodged itself on the shoreline, its bottom entirely overturned. In the remaining canoe, Alfred Walton clung on for dear life, unable to swim and with a deathly grip on the gunwale. The tumultuous rapids sent him and the canoe tumbling downstream. At times he was visible, and at times he disappeared from view. With black hair slicked behind him and holding on for dear life, Walton resembled a crow on the end of an ominous log. McMahon and I immediately began to throw everything we could out of our larger canoe and pushed out after Walton. I ordered McMahon to kneel down in the canoe so that I could see over him and steer us away from the imminent danger of rocks. By deftly changing his paddle from one side of the canoe to the other, McMahon helped us to avoid certain death. Our speed was incredible. Some of the boys later claimed that we were flying. Somehow I managed to stand up in the stern of the canoe and navigate us to Walton, who was clinging to a boat that had overturned. McMahon held on to the boat as I paddled us all to shore, however, we nearly lost Walton. He was on the precipice of death and could hardly hold on to the canoe. We took him to a sandy place and worked tirelessly, warming him in the sun until he came back to life. Once he was conscious again, we built a fire and laid him near it to get dry and warm. If we hadn't been able to catch the canoe just twenty yards farther downstream, Walton would have been doomed to another long and deadly ride. We left Walton by the fire and crossed the river, sloshing through the slack water back to where the rest of the boys were standing, wet, miserable, and mournful. They believed that everything was gone and that all was lost. Rogers reached into his pocket with a forlorn expression and pulled out three half dollars. Boys, this is all I have to my name, he lamented. The only garments he possessed were a pair of overalls and a shirt. Even if he possessed a fortune in gold, it would be of no use, as there were no vendors and nothing worth buying. I addressed the group. Gentlemen, we cannot change what has transpired, but we shall do our best regardless. Flip the canoe until it is upright and drain the water. Then we'll proceed downstream to check on Walton. They followed my directives, and to our surprise, upon riding the canoe, their clothes and blankets emerged intact. These light items had floated in the canoe and were protected. We then attempted to retrieve some of the weapons by joining hands and stretching out our arms but the underwater terrain was smooth as glass, causing all property to be swept away beyond our reach. No one could withstand the powerful current which came up above our knees. The eddy that saved the first canoe with the bedding and clothing was the result of a large boulder, nearly the size of a house, which had tumbled from above and partially obstructed the stream. Everything that sank was beyond rescue. We boarded the two canoes and traveled to Walton's location, where we camped overnight to aid his recovery. 
During our wait, I grasped my firearm and attempted to ascend high enough to evaluate the length of the dreadful canyon, but despite numerous efforts, I could not climb high enough to achieve any visibility. The mountain was bare rock in tiers, but travel from one level to the next was impossible. The terraces were overflowing with shattered rocks that had descended from above. After returning to the campsite, Walton was dry and comfortable, capable of conversation. He thanked us for saving him and claimed to feel better. While he had been underwater, he believed he might never resurface, but he persevered and ultimately emerged unscathed. He had no recollection of how he arrived on shore, as he was nearly dead when extracted from the water. The next day Walton was feeling much better, so we continued on our journey. However, we were now poorly armed. Between the seven of us we only had my rifle and McMahon's shotgun, which would provide little defense if we were attacked by either man or beast. Moreover, we still needed to find a way to scavenge food for ourselves. The terrain grew increasingly barren as we traveled, with the mountains on either side almost entirely devoid of trees. As night approached, we found ourselves floating in slack water near a steep rocky point towering above us. As we made our way down the river, I noticed three mountain sheep perched on a narrow terrace along one side of the point. Signaling to the others, I quickly ran ashore and, gun in hand, crept closer to the animals, using a pine tree as cover. The cedar bushes on the point provided additional hiding places, and I managed to position myself for a shot. Taking careful aim, I fired, hitting one of the sheep and sending it tumbling down the cliff. I reloaded and fired again, taking down the next largest sheep. The third sheep tried to escape by climbing down the bend, but I managed to shoot it before it got away. Although I didn't kill the third sheep right away, I was able to track it down and secure it, along with the other two. We all felt quite elated by our success, and McMahon even remarked that if he could shoot as well as I could, he'd never need another job. We joked and laughed, and for a brief moment, the perils of our journey faded into the background. The creatures before us were a stunning shade of blue, their fur thin and delicate like that of a deer, yet they bore a striking resemblance to goats. Three female beasts stared back at us, their straight horns standing tall against the sky. We made quick work of them, separating their meat from the bones and crafting a nourishing soup that satisfied our hunger. The flavor was rich, the meat like a delectable serving of mutton. Our adventure continued as we floated down the river, navigating dangerous rapids and treacherous waters. Though the river smoothed out as we went, the barren yellow mountains and hills on either side offered us no chance to escape and survey the land beyond. For miles we trekked through the twisting canyons. The only way out was to continue forward. But soon enough the mountains gave way and we came upon a stretch of cottonwood and willows that lined the increasingly calm river. We were growing desperate for sustenance, our hunt for game having been fruitless for too long. Yet in the distance we heard a sound that lifted our spirits. It was a distant gunshot echoing across the valley. We listened closely, hearing it again and again, and though we couldn't be sure, we were convinced that it was the sound of a firearm. We couldn't fathom how it could be possible for anyone else to be ahead of us in this remote land, especially anyone with access to firearms. We could only hope that it was a sign of civilization and the promise of new horizons. We might have stumbled upon a wagon train heading south through the unforgiving land. We had no idea settlements existed in that direction, but it was possible. Our discomfort and unease were tangible. If we encountered a hostile group, our rifle and shotgun would be next to useless. The boys joked about our scalp ending up on a spear handle, a few laughs to lighten the mood. But we came to this wild land to overcome our fears, not cower. We chose to confront our fears and face any consequences, be it survival or defeat. Our minds made up, we pressed on. A few moments later we spotted three Indian lodges on the banks of the river. We were certain who held the guns now. McMahon and I led the way with an Indian approaching us with his gun. He gestured for us to come on shore. A massive cottonwood tree lay across the river and I had to circle around it and land below. The boys following behind me were reluctant to do the same and landed where the Indian was, with his gun at the ready. I pulled our canoe downstream to a bunch of willows and we slipped through the foliage until we caught up with the others without alerting the natives. We paused and assessed the situation, only moving forward once we were sure they were not threatening us. We approached them immediately. 
There was some chatter amongst us, but it was clear that we weren't speaking the same tongue. We gestured, and they gestured back, and somehow it worked. They led us to their teepee, where we heard a word that sounded like Mormony, said with some uncertainty. Soon enough they exclaimed Buffalo, and we could gather that they were headed out on some kind of hunt. They brought us into their lodges and showed off blankets, knives, and guns. With a sweeping motion they declared that it was all Mormony. We figured out that they must have acquired these items from the Mormons. In one of the lodges we met an Indian with a kind face who seemed smarter than most mountain men. I realized that we were at their mercy and that these particular Indians were friendly with the Mormons. So I pulled the boys aside and told them we should pretend to be Mormons as well. We held our right hands over our hearts and joyfully exclaimed, Mormony, which convinced them we were devoted followers of Brigham. They immediately embraced us as brethren. The Indian who seemed to be in charge of the group introduced himself as Chief Walker using gestures and a few words. Lucky for me, I knew the sign language used by most tribes and was able to communicate well with him. I asked him how many days it took to reach Mormony, and he held up his left hand and then placed two fingers of his right hand astride it as though riding a horse. Then he closed his eyes and rested his head on his hand three times, indicating that it took three sleeps or four days to reach the Mormon settlement. He was curious about our destination, so I gestured towards the setting sun and the vast ocean, saying California. The western landscape appeared to be a vast, empty expanse, growing wider as it stretched towards the horizon. The mountains on the north side became smaller, while the ones on the south or east side remained towering and rugged. We had believed that the challenging part of our journey was over, anticipating a smooth and easy sail down the river to the Pacific and the promised land of gold, that is, until we encountered the Indians. When I informed Chief Walker of our destination, he appeared astonished and inquired as to why we were heading down the river when we wanted to travel west. I asked him how many days it would take to reach the ocean, but all he could do was shake his head and gesture to the water's scarcity in the direction he pointed. He then brought me to a flat sandy bar by the river bank and began to draw a map in the sand with a stick. He drew a long indented line, about ten feet in length, indicating the river, and then marked a straight line near the river's north end. He showed me the other streams that flowed into the Green River, and I realized that his drawings were correct. He placed small stones on either side of the cross on his map and rolled a willow twig in a circle around it, symbolizing the emigrant road. He traced the branches towards the north where the soldiers had gone, following the road that led to California, all accurate representations. Lastly, he sketched the river down which we had traveled, narrating its twists, turns, and dangers while driving his stick like a yoke, as if controlling a team of oxen. I watched in fascination as my newfound friend created a map of the river before us. With small stones, he carefully crafted the outline of the mountains on either side, and with a deep breath raised his hands high above his head, exclaiming, e -e 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 -e, as if to emphasize the immensity of the peaks before us. Moving downstream, he placed a single stone a bit farther away from the river, indicating a valley. He then drew the stones in close, building them up two or three tiers high and with both fists on top. He lifted his creation high above his head once more, shaking his head in warning as if to say, Awful bad canyon. As he continued to describe the river, he pointed towards his teepee, gesturing that we were close to our destination. I couldn't help but marvel at his intimate knowledge of the area, and I begged him to continue his map further down the river. He demonstrated two streams coming in on the east side, using longer and longer stones to mark their path. With one foot on either side of his imaginary river, he placed his hands on the rocks and lifted them high above his head, shouting, e -e 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 -e, mimicking the tumultuous rapids that lay ahead. With exaggerated gestures, he showed us how our canoe would toss and turn, eventually capsizing and casting us all into the churning waters. With a somber expression, he made the sign of death, warning us of the fatal consequences that lay ahead. His detailed map of the river left me in awe, and I knew that he possessed a deep understanding of the land around us. It was clear that he would be an invaluable guide on our journey. I understood plain as daylight from the conversation with Chief Walker that there was a treacherous canyon lying beneath the valley where we stood. 
The canyon was much higher than any we had crossed before, and the rapids could only be navigated at the risk of life. Walker's face was grave as he muttered the word Indiano. He then reached for his bow and arrows, pulling the bowstring taut and putting the arrow ominously close to my chest. Through his gestures he conveyed that the land ahead was hostile and unprotected, and without wariness it would be easy to lose our lives. After my confabulation with the chief, I approached the boys and briefed them on our situation. I explained our location and the challenges that lay ahead should we choose to continue towards California through this route. I stated that I preferred being killed by Mormons than by the Indians, and it would be wiser for us to walk to Salt Lake. Those who agree with me are welcome to join, I said, hoping to win over all of them. McMahon disagreed, stating that we could not comprehend the conversation with the chief, and it was a bad idea to follow his trail. He remarked that he had a map of the region, and it was just as secure to follow the river than traversing an unknown and harsh environment. I responded by saying that I had a firm grasp of the sign language and that the chief had considerable knowledge of his native country. I suggested that I would take one of his trails, get to Salt Lake, and take my chances from there. I had no difficulties with McMahon and Fields picking an alternative route if that's what they planned to do. In the end, McMahon and Fields refused to follow my path. I went to Chief Walker, and he showed me the way to Mormony as best he could. He directed me to enter the mountains that lead north, and as we made our way, he pointed out that we would come across an Indian camp where I should follow some freshly made horse tracks. He demonstrated this using his hands, mimicking a horse, and pointed the way. Some of the young men signaled for me to come and shoot at a target with them. Sensing it would appease them, I joined in and made sure to beat them every time. Then they wanted to swap guns with me, but I declined. The chief then approached me and invited me to go on a buffalo hunt with them. I explained that I had no horse, and he promptly summoned a beautiful gray one for me to ride if I agreed to join them. He also demonstrated his impeccable archery skills, showing how he could shoot an arrow straight through a buffalo behind its short ribs without touching any bone on its other side. These men were high-spirited and focused on the hunt. When Walker pointed out the trail, he gestured towards Salt Lake City. They all said the word buffalo distinctly. I took the chief's strong bow into my hands, but struggled to pull it halfway out. Yet I had no doubt he could do as he claimed. I was torn on whether to join them on the hunt, so I inquired how long it would take them to complete the long circuit and get to Salt Lake City. In response, he crushed some leaves in his hand and dispersed them in the air to mimic falling snow, indicating it would be by the time they arrived in Mormony. His actions and words sent chills down my spine, making me realize I had understood him correctly. I turned to the man and shook my head. Sorry, old friend, I can't come with you, I said, my finger pointing to the open maw of my mouth. If I had been alone, I might have changed my mind, but the other boys were counting on me. Still, we wanted to make a trade with these generous natives, so we offered to swap for a couple of their fine two-year-old horses. The man didn't want money, but was more than happy to take clothing of any sort. We parted with what we could afford to lose, including needles, thread, and a few odds and ends. One of the boys even offered Walker a coat, which he put on eagerly, sweating profusely in the intense heat. We saw that they had a few heads of cattle, which would be slaughtered if they didn't make any successful hunts soon. Despite our efforts to convince them to join us, McMahon and Field refused to come along on our journey. So we shared our small supply of dried meat and flour with them and prepared to take to the trail. Spirits lifted once our plans were set, and one of the boys even pulled out a makeshift fiddle made from cornstalks. Soon a lively dance involving both American and Indian participants broke out, and we all enjoyed ourselves until the late hours of the evening. We were grateful for the unexpected friendship of these natives, whose generosity and warmth had proven themselves beyond measure. On the morning of our departure I shared a dream I'd had with the others, assuring them that the path we had chosen was the right one. However, McMahon and Field seemed skeptical and instead proposed the notion of going with the Indians, or even following the river downstream. They complained they couldn't understand the native people, behaving as if it was a major obstacle. He said, I don't know about this Indian. He could lead us into a trap. They are known to be treacherous and vengeful. 
For some imagined slight, they could wipe us all out and no one would know what happened to us. My map shows no danger along this river, and I think we can make it to California without a problem. But Field and I aren't so quick to make a decision. Your chances don't look good. Despite McMahon's warnings, the boys loaded our few belongings onto the two colts. They had made up their minds to come with me. We said our goodbyes with faltering lips, wishing each other well on our journeys. Then my small group and I bowed to McMahon and Field, who we were leaving behind. Our heads were bare as we began our journey westward, out of the young cottonwoods and into the vast plains. As we traveled west, the mountains to the north grew smaller and less steep, while those on the other side of the river continued as far as we could see. The plain itself was bleak and lifeless, stretching out ahead of us for at least a hundred miles. Walker had told us to follow some horse tracks and enter a canyon several miles to the northwest. His hands worked like the nimble feet of a thoroughbred horse, tracing the path on the ground with careful precision. We trekked along the barren valley for what seemed like hours until we caught sight of Chief Walker charging towards us on his horse. We braced ourselves, fearing for the worst, that we would be taken captive and scalped. But the chief had come with a gentler purpose in mind. He had been keeping a keen eye on us and noticed that we had missed the trails he told us about. Without wasting a moment, he directed us to the faint horse tracks that we were to follow in the direction of Mormony, and gestured to the canyon we were headed to. Our journey would last three sleeps, he promised us, with an Indian camp waiting for us at the end. After bidding us farewell, he galloped back to his own camp. We resumed our travels with renewed vigor, closely monitoring the horse tracks as we drew closer to the mountain's spurs. We happened upon several well-defined paths running at a right angle to ours, signaling that we had reached the regular trail from Santa Fe to Los Angeles. As nightfall approached, we settled near a cluster of large rocks, discovering pools of water stored in the flat rocks, which were filled by the rain. As readers of modern times, it may be necessary to pause and consider that in 1849 the geography of the West was still widely unknown, with only the most daring hunters and trappers braving the journey. These men, steeped in the ways of the wild, had experience in the mysterious ways of the trail and the chase, but only investigated portions of the wilderness that suited their needs. The reputation of the Indians in this area was that they were savage and brutal, relishing in the bloodshed and torture of their victims. However, amidst the barren and untamed landscape, we stumbled upon a chief and his tribe, Walker and his followers, who were nothing but hospitable and kind towards us white folk. It baffles me to this day how well acquainted this man was with the land, creating for us an accurate map in the sand and leading us away from dangerous terrain and hostile natives, information that even our own explorers had yet to uncover. Chief Walker, therefore, played a crucial role in our survival, saving our band from certain doom and leading us to safety in a threefold way. For over forty years I have credited my life and the lives of my comrades to the compassionate and prudent Chief Walker. In a nearby pool or pond I was able to catch a small duck, which we cooked over a bed of abundant sage that grew in the area. Our party was small, consisting of just five men and two young ponies, along with a meager supply of provisions provided to us by the Chief himself. The next morning we set out on our journey, tracing our faint trail until we reached the canyon that we had been searching for. Following the chief's instructions, we made our way up the canyon, uncovering a small running stream and vegetation growing scatteringly along the way. Although we detected signs of deer and grouse, we couldn't dawdle, for I was the only member with a gun, and to hunt would mean holding the rest of the group back. As we finally reached the summit at a low pass, we caught sight of snow-covered banks on the north side of the mountain. Using the chief's guidance, we diverged from our path, tracking horse prints over steep hillsides. As we continued our trek, we stumbled upon the Indian camp, consisting of two or three lodges. Although the men were out hunting, the women welcomed us warmly as they gathered and baked a root resembling the common carrot. They gathered and heaped bushels of the roots together, covering them in earth to prepare for cooking. A fire blazed fiercely beneath the pile, much as a charcoal burner might tend to his coal pit. 
When the roots had cooked to a proper consistency, they were beaten and mashed into small cakes, which were then left to dry under the blazing sun. The cakes, black as coal, were intended for winter use, providing sustenance in times of scarcity. But prior to roasting, the roots held a bitter juice, which would smart the tongue and cause sores. Yet once cooked, they possessed a rich and savory flavor. As we passed by a group of natives, a woman pointed to our horses and exclaimed, Walker! We had received these horses from him, but that did not mean they knew our association with him. They may have mistaken us for horse thieves. As night had not yet fully descended, we continued onward to camp beside a clear, rushing stream where large pine trees grew. Soon some of the Indian tribe we had passed earlier came to our camp bringing venison for trade. We offered needles and other small trinkets in return, which they eagerly accepted. They even challenged me to a shooting competition, but I knew the game and beat them all squarely. They expressed interest in trading guns, but I refused their offer. A portion of the venison helped to sustain us, for wild game was scarce on the trail. Only a handful of sage hens had crossed our path, and we had even resorted to making soup from a hawk's catch. After days of grueling travel, hunger crept upon us, and we considered the possibility of slaughtering one of our colts for food. We had made do with two meager meals per day, but our hard work required more sustenance. We couldn't help but wonder if Walker's claim of riding over this long road in just three sleeps was indeed true. Regardless, our journey had gone just as he said it would, but doubts lingered in our minds. On the eighth day we came across a well-worn trail that led downhill to the north, and by the ninth day we stumbled upon a vast valley where we spotted a group of covered wagons. These travelers, part of a train en route to Los Angeles through the southern route, were waiting for cooler weather given the arduous, desert-heavy trek. Their abundance of food lifted our spirits immensely, and we shared with them our tales of hardship. Our party decided to offer our walking skills in exchange for room and board since our funds were largely depleted. John Rogers had only a dollar and a half to his name, while I had a meager thirty dollars. We were roughly sixty miles south of Salt Lake City, and some of the boys began working in exchange for meals, while the rest were to join the train after procuring flour and bacon. Hazelrig and I took the two colts and headed for the city, where we hoped our limited funds could stretch to supply our needs. As we neared Salt Lake City, specifically Hobble Creek, where a Mormon fort and a plethora of wagons from a prospecting train were located, we remained hopeful that our little purse would suffice. As we searched among the wagons for someone to ask about our whereabouts, a woman came forward from the last wagon. I was astounded to learn that it was Mrs. Bennett, the wife of the man I had been pursuing this entire voyage. He had carried all of my equipment with him, and was always eager to know whether I would eventually catch up with them. We lingered until the men arrived back with their prized herd in the evening. Bennett was overjoyed to see me, I assure you. We devoured a hearty dinner and then spent the entire night sitting around the campfire recounting every experience we had since leaving Wisconsin. I had missed Bennett at the Missouri River. Council Bluffs was the only location I knew of where people crossed the river, but I had searched tirelessly and found no trace of him. It was then that I discovered they had crossed further up the river at a place called Canesville, a Mormon crossing, and had followed the north side of the Platte River. Their only misfortune had been losing a commendable black horse that was staked out. When a herd of buffaloes came coursing by, he busted his rope and trailed after them. They hunted for him, along with the other horses, but he was never to be found. No doubt some lucky Mr. Lowe had made off with such a prize. Hazelrig and I revealed our experiences on the south side of the Platte, why we took a detour to the Green River, the testing times we endured, how we were halted by the Indians— and how we came across from the river. We emerged the day before and were now headed to Salt Lake City to buy flour and bacon so that we could proceed with the train when they embarked. They had informed us that if we could travel on foot, they would carry our provisions for us. Mr. Bennett wouldn't hear of me traveling to Salt Lake City, for he said there must be enough supplies in the group. The next day we bought flour and bacon from John Phillips of Mineral Point, Wisconsin, and William Phillips, his brother. We loaded up on provisions for the journey ahead, gathering a whopping one hundred pounds of flour and a heap of bacon among other odds and ends. 
Though the others came up empty-handed, I dipped into my own pockets, having recently sold my horse to Dallas, and paid for it all. I sent Hazelrig back to camp with a share of the loot and instructions to do the best he could with the ponies. As for myself, armed with my trusty gun, ammo, clothing, and other necessities I had procured in Wisconsin, I shared what little money I had left with the other boys, knowing how tough the journey ahead would be. But despite our meager circumstances, I was confident we could make it through unscathed. As we continued on, I listened soberly as Mr. Bennett regaled us with tales of our impending journey on the north side of the Platte. He regaled us with stories of cholera that had struck the trail and taken a few brave souls, and how our roles and attitudes towards each other would shift and change as we left civilization, law, and all its niceties behind. It was curious to see how some of the most upstanding and model citizens back home would change once out on these wild expanses. They would fume with anger and rage at the slightest provocation, only the wisdom of their older counterparts preventing outright bloodshed on more than one occasion. Others would break the sacred bonds and covenants they had made with their fellow travelers, ignoring the solemn promises they had made to travel together in order and stand by each other, even unto death. Some would even split off from the main group entirely, seeking out new companions and alliances. And it was not uncommon to see even the most peaceable folks turn against each other over petty squabbles or disagreements over how to divide up the loot. In moments of pure spite they would take a knife to the joint outfit, splitting wagons and carts in two, ruining the whole thing for everyone involved. Such were the dangers of life on the frontier, where man was left to fend for himself, and the bonds that held him together threatened to snap at any moment. The land was ravaged with endless disputes, each one uglier than the last, and the animosity festered beneath the surface in ways that exposed the participants' true nature. Guns were drawn on numerous occasions, poised to take someone's life, but typically someone interfered and prevented a gory outcome. Yet others fervently adhered to honesty and lawfulness, so much so that they adhered to prescribed rules even more stringently than what was advised by common laws and religious doctrines. They followed their captain's commands without fuss, treating everyone with the same respect they would want for themselves. These individuals were the pride of the convoy. Most of the groups had organized themselves, following at a distance where the riverbed could still be seen. Buffalo and antelope roamed by in scores, trailed by wolves that were eagerly scouting for injured or lifeless animals to feed upon. The wagon caravan made the most of the bison meat, which was in excess, providing enough nourishment to see them through the upcoming regions of barren land where hunting with restricted opportunities. Following a string of adventurous tales from Bennett and myself, I was seized with an incentive to investigate Bennett's odd choice of route. He had assuredly taken a longer, more roundabout way, unlike the originally agreed-upon itinerary. I posed the question to him, and he illuminated me on the issue. He declared that it was perilous to take the straight path with only seven hundred miles left to travel. The forthcoming rainy season would render the journey through the Sierra Nevada mountain range too fraught with risk. Mountainsides frequently experienced snowfall of up to twenty feet or more, an environment that was unsuitable for travelers on foot. Furthermore, even if the group could brave the snow, they risked starvation as the base of the mountains was devoid of wildlife and sources of sustenance were sparse. Consulting with mountain experts who were knowledgeable of the region, Bennett learned that the southern route by way of Los Angeles held a higher promise of survival, even though none of the wagons that had attempted the route had passed through. However, after almost a century of trailblazing through the desolate deserts of the area, a way was beaten and the trail would be widened to fit the wagons. After days of heated debates and conversations by the campfire, we finally settled on the southern route. Captain Hunt, a Mormon man with multiple wives, agreed to lead us along the way. Despite his unconventional home life, he had managed to persuade us of his experience and knowledge of the road. In fact, each of us was willing to pay him ten dollars for his services. Our end goal was San Bernardino, a Spanish land grant that the Mormon church had purchased. I imagine we believed that a wagon road there would be quite advantageous for us all. Indeed, the southern route seemed much safer than the treacherous northern mountain pass, especially during this time of year. 
However, some folks among us, those who were familiar with the history of the Mormons in Illinois and Missouri, were still wary. They had heard of the Mormons' vengeful tendencies, and it was not uncommon for travelers to deny their origins in Missouri for fear of retribution. I still recall one Mormon man boasting that some Missourians on the plains would never make it to California. He spoke of injustices done to the Mormons in the past, and his face grew dark with anger. As we made our way through the wilds, it was clear that the Mormons in Salt Lake were like an island in the vast sea. With the band of destroying angels led by Brigham Young at their backs, no enemy could touch them. Late into the night we finally drifted off to sleep, the darkness enveloping us like a warm blanket. The next day stretched out before us, clear and bright, full of possibilities. After a hearty breakfast, Mr. Bennett approached me with an offer I couldn't refuse. Now, Lewis, I want you to come with me. I have two sturdy wagons, two skilled drivers, four yokes of oxen, and enough provisions to last us through the journey. Your gear is still safe with me, including your trusty gun, ammunition, and two good hickory shirts, perfect for the present weather. You won't have to lift a finger. Just keep your eyes peeled for game to add to our supplies. It'll be a big help to us all. Grateful for the offer, I eagerly accepted, feeling well taken care of thanks to Mr. Bennett's kindness. We asked around among the other wagons and managed to scrape together some extra flour and bacon for the other boys, which I paid for. I gave all my remaining money to Hazelrig, sending him on ahead to the other boys in camp. The wagons that made up our intended train were scattered about, having set out from Salt Lake City at random times. It was deemed too early to start the journey down south, as the scorching desert heat wouldn't ease up until later in the season. Only then could we safely cross the treacherous southwestern part of the desert. The members of the train slowly began to converge, and Captain Hunt made it clear that we needed some sort of organized system to move forward. "'We must move like an army,' he declared. "'With me as the leader, dictating the rules and laws we must all follow.' However, if the majority rules otherwise in case of necessity, their decision will be final. It was decided that we should attempt a day-long march together before setting up camp to formally organize our journey, and hopefully avoid any potential problems that may arise. They did as they were told, and soon enough a vast number of people and animals assembled at the camp. They had over one hundred and seven wagons and around five hundred horses and cattle. The group was separated into seven different divisions, each one able to elect its own captain. Number one division was tasked with leading the charge on the first day, and they were responsible for taking care of the stock and delivering them to the wagons in the morning. They would take the rear end once they were done, and division number two would take the lead to break the trail. The rear division would rest until ten o'clock the next morning before it was time to move out. It would take until late at night for them to reach their new camp and unhitch the wagon animals. The sheer quantity of animals had wiped out the feed for a mile radius around the campsite. Finally, everyone received instructions to attend a general meeting for the purpose of creating a better organization. Mr. L. Granger stood up so he could see his audience properly and began to lay out the plan. He read a preamble and several resolutions, prepared ahead of time to serve as the basis for government. One sentence that stuck out in my memory was, This organization shall be known and designated as the Sand Walking Company, and shall consist of seven divisions, etc. They laid out the structure of the group, as we had outlined earlier, with each division having its own marching plan. Captain J. Hunt was chosen as the commander and guide for the group, and everyone pledged to obey his orders. They even had contingency plans laid out on paper for any conceivable problems that might arise. With their solid agreement, they were ready to start their journey. Chapter 6 The Barren Land We left our camp with a confident stride, ready to face whatever lay ahead. As we made our way towards Little Salt Lake, our group sought to take a shortcut in order to save some time. However, after only a day or two, Captain Hunt returned from scouting ahead and advised us all to turn back to the original trail. Reluctantly, we followed his advice, not realizing this decision would have dire consequences for our train. The journey became much more difficult as we approached the rim of the basin, where we could see the terrain dramatically shift. All water flowed towards the north and Great Salt Lake within the basin, but as we crossed over the rim, it all shifted towards the Colorado River, which led to the Pacific Ocean. As we approached this new terrain, a different train led by Captain Smith caught up with us. 
They carried with them a map created by a local mountaineer, Williams of Salt Lake, that supposedly showed a shorter route through Tular Valley, closer than the route through Los Angeles. This map became the topic of much discussion within our camp. It showed every camp on the road, where to find water and grass, and how to overcome any obstacles one might encounter. Even our Reverend J. W. Breyer was convinced that the new route would be the superior choice. The more we talked about it, the more people became convinced that the shortcut was the way to go. A meeting was called to discuss the matter in greater detail. Captain Hunt, the leader of our group, made it clear that he had been hired to take the Los Angeles route, but he would follow the will of the majority. He emphasized, however, that if even one wagon chose to stick to the original path, he would feel bound to follow them. But by then it was too late. The allure of the shortcut was too strong, and too many were convinced it was the right choice. It would be a decision we would soon come to regret. Many of us were eager to hear Captain Hunt's thoughts on the new route, as he was a seasoned mountain man and could offer valuable advice. After some coaxing, he finally spoke up and admitted that he knew no more than the rest of us about the route, and expressed doubts that any white man had ever traveled it. He cautioned that it would not be safe for those with families to attempt the unknown road, but young men without family may be able to brave it and save time on their journey. However, Captain Hunt assured us that he would follow us down any path, even if it led straight to hell. As we continued on our journey from Salt Lake, the landscape grew increasingly barren, with sparse grass and sagebrush taking over where trees once stood. We encountered Severe Lake and Little Salt Lake along the way, the latter of which was almost completely dry with a snowy white beach. It may have been more impressive in rainy weather, but it seemed like a rather dull affair when we saw it. At one point we entered a narrow valley thick with sagebrush, and it quickly became apparent that this was the perfect habitat for large-eared rabbits, which we now know as jackrabbits. Everyone with a gun took advantage of the opportunity, and shooting could be heard from all directions. Smoke clouds billowed up as the hunters chased after the rabbits, who scurried in every direction to escape. Some even ran right beneath the feet of our cattle and wagons, forcing teamsters to kill them with their whips. After the frenzy was over and we set up camp, we counted over five hundred rabbits, providing us with a rare feast of fresh meat. 